Program to be useful, so I was always a C-sharp person. I never really um, used Python for much of my career. Um, and I remember eight years ago, I wanted to build um, an, basically an algorithm to predict how early I needed to leave my house in order to be on time to catch a flight. And for that, I needed to basically scrape all the data from the website of the uh, airport I live close to. And I built that in C-sharp. And it was a very, very big program that took a lot of time to build. And I dreaded the moment I ever had to maintain it and look at it again. A friend of mine told me, go look at Python. I was like, nah, I'm not going to learn that. There's, nah, no way. A couple of years later, I actually needed to do the same thing. I looked at the code, and I said, I'm never going to do it again. And I decided to try Python. And probably 20 lines later, I was able to achieve the same outcome. And from then onwards, obviously, I went from looking at every single problem in the world as something you could fix with C Sharp, and now looking at every single problem in the world being something you can fix with Python. A little bit extreme sometimes, but that's a little bit just a background on my relationship with Python. Um, on this session today, I want to talk to you a little bit about Visual Studio Code, VS Code, how we can be productive on Python using VS Code generically, then specifically for data science, okay? How we can use it for data science in a productive way. There's a bunch of new announcements that we've done in the last couple of months, and the last one two days ago, and I'm gonna walk you through this, um, through demos. And last but not least, uh, walk you a little bit into uh, the Azure Machine Learning um, Services and MLOps. Let's start first with Python by the numbers. And, and you might have seen this before. The adoption of Python is, is brutal. Okay, um, it's not just in college, it's not just for um, enthusiasts, it's not just for young kids, it's probably one of the first languages that's, that, that's super universal and goes everywhere. And these numbers that you see here, I'm pretty sure they're gonna grow another 2% year on year, okay? Sorry, can, do you want me to speak louder? Yes, absolutely, will do, thank you. Um, why is Python growing? Um, and Python is grow or where is it growing? Obviously you've seen it as, a, as an app uh, building la uh, language. We've seen it a lot uh, uh, with Django and Flask also on the websites or as a web platform uh, uh, programming language, but we definitely see it growing significantly on the data science side. And that's where you see a lot of the growth coming into. And obviously we all, we're all here. Some of us might have used R in the past and we've seen how quickly Python has taken over even the most hardcore uh, R fans um, by basically replicating a lot of the, um, the existing libraries, libraries that R had, while at the same time providing a lot of new features that only uh, Python can do. Now let's dig in a little bit into VS Code. Now, how many of you know VS Code or use VS Code? Show your hands. Quite a few of you. Cool, thank you. Um, you've seen VS Code. Um, it has obviously built-in language support, IntelliSense, you can type in and you'll get um, a little bit of an advice on, on, on how that, um, or, or linting on how that those functions work or what else can you type. Um, debugging, obviously integration with Git or other uh, uh, code repositories. For me, the best thing is obviously it's free it's cross, and it's cross-platform, meaning today I can be on this device, next day or next hour I can be on that device, and this is something I do very frequently. Same experience, works the same, really, really quick. Um, Obviously, being fast and lightweight is super important for me also. Um, I used to use Visual Studio, and Visual Studio is still an awesome IDE for very specific workloads, very high-end professional developer. For me, for a lot of the work that I do, the fact that I can just launch VS Code like that, whatever I am, and get it done is super important for me. Now, also very important is the Python extension. Uh, which is where VS Code comes into really um, um, full, cir uh, full circle with Python. That extension, right now the Microsoft one, is the most used uh, um, Python extension. is updated every month. There's a blog, um, a blog that follows and every month gives the updates. And, uh, and the links are at the end of the slide and you can follow along what, what we've seen. Now I'll show you a little bit of where we are today with this. But if I look a year ago, I would use VS Code uh, with Python in particular for like if I was doing something on Flask, no problem, for sure. For data science, I would still be leaning on either, either doing anything or everything on a notebook or doing some things on Spider or other IDs. Today, where we are today, I'm pretty comfortable on doing everything on VS Code already. And it keeps growing and growing every month. 
Another interesting thing that I will demo is remote development, okay? So, and one of the examples I'm, I'm gonna show, I'm not gonna show you WSL. WSL is the, wind, the Windows subsystem for Linux. It's basically a Linux kernel that you might have heard runs inside Windows 10 machines. So basically if you have Windows 10, you install an Ubuntu or any other distribution that's supported and you basically just open a shell and you have a bash shell on that micro container running um, on Windows. Um, because today I'm not using, using a Windows machine, I will use something else, which is I will use remote development on a container, on a Docker container on, on this machine here. Um, and basically imagine the following scenario. You have a lot of environments or you have a special configuration that needs to run on a specific version of Linux, spin up a container, the code automatically gets deployed, the environment that you want automatically gets deployed to that container, and you run the code from VS Code on your machine remotely on that container. I think this is better shown than talked about, so I'm gonna demo um, all of this to you. Here's VS Code. If you have not seen before, we have extensions here. If you go, you just type Python, you'll see the Python extension. That's the one I'm talking about. If you go to the change log, you'll see everything that's get added, every, um, every, um, every other week, or I'm sorry, every other month, okay? Um, let me just, sorry, just give me one, yeah, sorry. If you launch the, the, the command line, you can do a lot of work directly here from the, no, sorry, give me a second, I'm gonna try to talk louder or move the laptop a little bit closer. If you type Python, you will have access to all the different commands that we'll be working on today, okay? Um, the first one I'm gonna show to you is just basically running a normal, um, just a normal program. So I have a basic plot from the matplotlib. Um, you can just get it running locally and you, you, you get what you would expect to see, a signed function, uh, no big thing there. Um, if you, you can, Obviously, you start seeing the, the linting and the help, obviously, going when you over, over the functions. Um, other things you can do, you can run the current file on an interactive window. That's one of the first things that's interesting. So now you actually have interactive Python running in. I can close this window. Let me open up a little bit more space. You actually have interactive Python running inside VS Code. In reality, what's doing, it's, as you can see, it's spinning up Jupyter Notebook okay, in your local machine, um, and you basically have this code that I was running right here. Same thing, same thing, and this is a normal interactive window, so if I do import num numpy as np, whoops, as np, um, np.py, you, you'll see it's a normal interactive, uh, um, normal interactive window. I can run pieces of this code also. What you expected to see, um, oh, sorry, give me a second. Run selection, for instance, in the Python terminal. So I can still run it on the terminal down here. I can run it directly on the interactive window. There's a lot of work I can do in between this, either the interactive console or the command line. So, and this is, this is really what I'm starting to see, that that type of interaction that I used to have or need a notebook or need another IDE now it comes full circle inside, um, um, inside VS Code, which makes me much more productive. Um, if I open up, obviously I have access to the plots. I can, all the plots that I'm using, and I can zoom in, zoom out, a very, um, a very, actually a very productive way of working directly from the, uh, from the, uh, from the IDE. Another interesting thing that we have here is obviously the variables. Um, so you have all the variables that I'm using on this interactive console. Um, so you can explore the variables. You can actually look at the data. Um, and for instance, you can filter it. Let me see, I wanna filter only the 0 0.1s. Whoops, 0 0.1, there you go, those are the items. So it's, it gives you a little bit of extra pro productivity um, features that you can do directly from, uh, from the, the, the interactive window. Now, what I like about this is if you see something that you're missing, because the product group that's developing this, um, the Python um, um, tools for, uh, for VS Code, they are so open. You can just go get, get engaged with them on either through the blog or on GitHub and just request a new feature, okay? So it, again, every month, new features today, very comfortable with what I see, 
I'm fully productive straight on VS Code, but we can keep adding and we can keep requesting more things to come um, into play. Let, now let's go into remote. As I um, as I shown you before, we were running all of this locally, right? So um, I'm on my I'm locally on this machine. Okay, I'm gonna now connect to a container. Okay, inside this machine. So a Docker container with a um, um, basically a Linux version. It's going to ask me to pick um, uh, uh, pick an interpreter. Just give me a second to it will get there. I don't need this right now. Select the byte. I'm going to go here. It's full on. Okay, I'm going to run it. Hold on, sorry. And you saw basically it created this. You don't because it's on a container. You don't get to see the obviously the the matplotlib output, but it created the this, the same image. Okay, and if you don't believe me, you can see that we are not on my Mac. Okay, we're on the that Linux container that I was creating before. I can go back and say, oh, I want to go back to my machine. Reopen locally. And if I run it again, you'll see it. I'm running on. Um, Hold on, sorry, I need to pick the, the right interpreter. Give me a second. And you can do, and here's the interesting thing. Right now you can do it from here, or you can just go again on the window, sorry, on the window up, up there and just pick the, um, pick, select the interpreter, um, the Python interpreter from here, okay? Gonna use this one, gonna run it again. Come on. There you go. As you can see, and I'm on, on this machine. Okay, so these are basics that show you the beginning of how, where we are in terms of using um, productively VS Code for a lot of scenarios for which in the past I used to need other, um, other tools to complement VS Code. Now let's look a little bit into data science inside VS Code. We saw, uh, um, obviously we saw a little bit about notebooks and that, that's fine. Um, but when you look at machine learning on Azure, um, the bigger picture that we have, and I'm sorry if the kind of the the, the fonts might be a little bit small uh, on the screen. We look at it from five layers, basically. Um, the first one is we can look at working with pre-trained models. I'm sorry? Oh, if we can dim the spotlights. Thank you. Um, would it be possible? Thank you very much. Thank you. Apologies for that. Uh, so on the top layer, we're looking at pre-trained models, okay? So what I call AI as a service. So if you want to look into a computer vision, uh, you have a computer vision problem, you have a speech, uh, natural language uh, uh, problem, um, you need cognitive search, you can just call an API and pass it the data and get, get a response either with a, in the case of computer vision, uh, this object is class A, B, C, D, so a typical classification problem. Um, I see um, object X in this picture uh, um, as a, 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 an ima image uh, detection problem. You can do all of that by calling APIs. That's kind of the pre-trained model approach. The second layer is actually building when you need to build, when you need to build uh, um, models by yourself. You can use code as we saw before. You can use notebooks, um, common line, or other IDEs. Then comes the frameworks that you want to build on, and obviously we'll support any framework that you decide to build on. My preferred one today is Keras with a, um, a TensorFlow backend, but I'm seeing, for instance, PyTorch being phenomenally used, um, and now the fast AI library on top of PyTorch, on top of PyTorch being delivering uh, phenomenal results when it comes to ease of use and, uh, and performance, okay? And obviously, then we go into the kind of the model management layers, okay? Where we'll talk about Azure Machine Learning. And at the bottom, obviously, we'll have basically the hardware infrastructure in which we train and run these models, which can be G CPUs, um, GPUs, uh, uh, FPGAs, um, deployed on-premises, on the cloud, um, on your device, on your phone, or on your um, IoT gateway. Now we're going to focus um, a little bit first on VS Code and, and, and notebooks. So the first news I want to share um, is that obviously we can now work very closely with notebooks inside VS Code. And the, the thing that was announced two days ago is actually we used to have to import the notebook. Now we can actually open the notebook natively um, inside VS Code. 
okay? And we can do things like debugging your cells. We can interactively add cells either in a Python file or in the notebook itself. So there's a, uh, we've shown, I've shown you already a couple of these things here, but it's really, really interesting to see. So I'm gonna jump straight into the demo. Okay, the first thing I wanna show you is talk, is talk to you about um, this exact um, problem that I have. It's a custom vision problem. So I wanna pass a picture of, um, of, a, of a picture of a plane and I want it to tell me which airline is on that picture. Okay, simple, usual, typical uh, image classification problem. Okay, so this is what I did in the beginning. On my laptop, I built a model on TensorFlow and this is just the code, the inference code, basically to just go and show what's happening on the, um, uh, on that picture. So if you look at, um, this is the image, okay? Um, this is just calling the inference model, okay? And then outputting the, the result, okay? Which is, and this model is super sure with 99.999% accuracy, that's a, a plane from Singapore Airlines, okay? So I'm gonna move back into, into, um, into VS Code and I'm gonna, and you see I have here, the Python notebook, I'm gonna open it. And what you'll see after a little bit is that actually I have this, a, a similar Jupyter interface inside uh, VS Code. Now, you might like Jupyter on a white background, and I know I like Visual Studio with a, a black background, so this might look a little bit different, but I promise if you turn the, the theme of VS Code into a white theme, you'll, this looks much, much closer to a, a um, a normal, normal Jupyter notebook. So I could run this straight down and we'll do exactly the same thing, okay? So that, that, that's the, the, uh, um, the first thing I can do and I, and I can call any of these lines you'll see here. I can rearrange them, I can insert new lines, I can still use the variables as before, um, as I showed before. Now, the other thing that we can use is actually to import this into a Python file. So actually, I have the Jupyter notebook, I wanna import it into, um, to a Python script. Okay, and here you have the same code. Let me just close the window to maximize a little bit. Here you have the same code fully on already um, as a Python file. Okay, and what you'll see here is that when I put this tag, and I'm gonna put it here, the same thing. When I put these tags inside, which obviously you can see they are comments, it's just VS Code is interpreting those Python comments as something else. When I put those tags here, I can start treating that Python file as a discrete, um, almost like a notebooky experience. So it's halfway between a pure Python experience and a notebook. I can have like something in the middle that in the IDE behaves like a notebook, but if I take it out of the IDE, it's a normal Python file. Okay, so that's something that's actually super cool and I'm really um, excited about using uh, more recently. Um, trying to make sure I don't forget to demo anything to you guys today. Um, what I can do, I, actually I can sh go back to the, the basic plot and what I can do here, don't save. If I go here, I can do the same thing, which is I'll put this here and I can debug the cell, so it's gonna run, and it's gonna show me a debug window, and there you'll see, in that, I didn't have to set a breakpoint, I could do almost like a fake breakpoint. You'll have the, the preds, um, it's actually, it doesn't matter, it was for another, another uh, Python file, but you'll have here the local variables, okay? And you have access to the call stack and everything that's going on. Okay, even from the debugging experience, the ability to do this, it's really, really cool. Okay. Let me go back. Now, when we look at the frameworks, and I'm gonna, I know we're running, we started a little bit late, apologies for that, so I'll try to accelerate, accelerate a little bit. When you look at the, the frameworks that we support, we support obviously the typical data science and machine learning frameworks that everybody is working on, or most people are working on, obviously, but we also did an intentional effort with, with Facebook and now with several other companies on building an interchangeable format called Onyx, which you can see on the, on the right. 
I, it's, it's picking up adoption. Obviously, it's not mainstream today, but it's picking up adoption as a really good lingua, lingua franca between the different machine learning models. Okay? Um, and it allows us, for instance, in my case, to deploy a model that I put on Onyx that I can download from the web, deploy it immediately on very different types of devices. And that form factor is important because if today, think of like this model, CARES with a TensorFlow back end, uh, back end. If I want to deploy it on my phone versus this machine versus an IoT gateway, it's going to be completely different. Once the full promise of Onyx is there, I have one model converted into Onyx that can be deployed on any platform, okay? Regardless of being an edge platform, a full-on inference cluster in the cloud or my own mobile device. So that's something we're working on with Facebook and a lot of other hard hardware vendors and that we hope to see uh, come forward um, as an open, open source and an open uh, consortium uh, uh, for this, to fix kind of the proliferation of model, models and model management frameworks. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about Azure Machine Learning Services, okay? And kind of the problem that we've seen so far, so, so that, 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 that example I showed before of that inference of the airline, I built it on my laptop, I trained it on actually on that one, which is a Surface uh, Pro with a GeForce um, discrete graphics card. Um, I deployed locally the first couple of times, it takes 15 minutes to, to, to build a model, it makes a lot of noise because all the fans start working um, and I can only get an accuracy of 90%, okay? Because the, small, the file size is small, um, I have to make a lot of compromises to run on a machine like that. What if I had a platform, super easy to just deploy that model, take care of the training, of the data versioning, of the model versioning, of the deployment to a web service, all of that end to end, without me having to write the, all the code by myself, okay? And that's what I'm gonna show you with Azure Machine Learning Service, okay? Again, it's basically a platform for helping you manage your data science life cycle in a more productive way. More productive and also more collaborative. Meaning, obviously, I'm submitting the code to GitHub. That code can be seen by anyone else, but also if anyone else wants to run an experiment based on my data or based on my experiment pipeline, they can do it all the same, centrally from the same uh, repository and from the same platform. So beyond, uh, beyond a little bit of, um, beyond that, the Azure Machine Learning Services also gives us several different interfaces for several different types of users. Today, I'm gonna focus on notebooks again and on the SDK uh, with VS Code, but depending on your level of proficiency with code and with data science, you could either use uh, automated machine learning or you could use um, a visual interface, okay? And if you kind of look at the split, depending on whether you're a full-on data scientist or you are a, f a full-on developer or both or neither, you will have some of the right tools for doing the right job, okay? And that full support is where we want to be at, okay? Today, as I said, I'm going to focus on the top end, Python SDK and uh, uh, notebooks. So on the notebook VMs, so immediately as part of the backend from the Azure uh, Machine Learning Services, you have access to notebook VMs, which you can provision, decide which size you want the machine to be, whether it wants to be a GPU enabled or not, uh, or not a machine, whether you want it to be always running, or you want to have a, a pool of up to five VMs that start only on demand whenever someone requests one of them. You can obviously tune all, all, all of that. The good thing is that whenever someone starts, a notebook on one of those VMs, immediately everything is configured. They don't have to go and mess about getting the right Conda environment or the right packages installed. It should be covering the vast majority of what's needed today, okay? And as it gets updated, because you can pull uh, new versions, obviously you'll get the latest versions of TensorFlow right now with 2.0, you'll get the latest versions of everything um, that, that's coming up. Same applies for the SDK. Better shown than, 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 than told, so I'm going to go into the demo again. Before I go into the demo, obviously, I'm going to show a lot of this, both on the UI on the web and on VS Code. Whatever you see on the UI, which is where I'm going to start, you can also access in VS Code through the Azure Machine Learning extension for VS Code. So the first extension I showed was Python. The second one I will show a little bit is the, the, the same extension for Azure Machine Learning. Now, the scenario I'm going to walk you through is 
um, what's in there. Okay, step one, we kind of, di we, I didn't show you how I trained that model, but I showed you the inference piece on my local machine. Um, if you remember, um, you can see it's running on my machine. Okay. Step two that we're going to go is we're going to go into Azure Machine Learning Studio. I'm going to show it. Then I'm going to go into another notebook and I'm going to do the model training or show you how to do the training and the, and the monitoring of the training process and saving that resulting model in a central repository that's obviously version and can be shared by different people. Step number three, I'm going to take that model and I'm going to deploy it as a web service, also using Jupyter Notebooks. Last step, I'll just run inference on that model, which is what we did on the first step, but by calling the web service that I deployed through Azure Machine Learning Services. Okay? You can see um, the architecture on, on, on the right, or a, a macro architecture of what I'm trying to achieve. Okay? Cool, let's go into ml.azure.com. Apologies if there is any glitches. The good thing of being on preview, on the preview uh, uh, branch is that I uh, sometimes I deploy things overnight like they did this night. So <laughs> I hope I find all the buttons in the right place um, and no unexpected glitches. So what you'll see here, I talked about automated machine learning, visual interfaces. We're gonna focus primarily on notebooks today, okay? Um, Obviously, as part of a productive data, data science lifecycle management platform, you have your data sets, they are versioned. The idea of versioning them is basically being able to build a model based on different versions of the data. But at the same time, once the model gets deployed, understanding data drift and understanding whether we need to flow back and retrain the model based on the model performance in production as, it, as time goes by. Obviously, the experiments that I'm running at a specific point in time, I might be running several experiments. I might have many models on the same experiment. The models themselves that I built as part of those experiments and the endpoints, which is basically just uh, the web service endpoints that I can build based on those models to inf infer for inference, basically. Okay. On the management side, so this is kind of the, 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 the machine learning experience. On the management side, you'll have the ability, obviously, to manage your clusters. Those are the compute clusters I have um, um, in, this, uh, in this workspace. By the way, the macro container for this is called the workspace. It's an Azure machine learning workspace. Um, you can see I have the CPU cluster has one node running. I can come in and say, you know what? Um, I actually don't need anything running right now because I'm not training. Um, if I do need training, I'm okay with waiting you for, for you to spin up the machine, okay? So now you'll see it's gonna start decommissioning, uh, resizing, now it's resizing from one to zero. What th this means is that before, if I wanted to run, a, run um, an experiment targeting that specific cluster, if I only run one, it starts immediately. If I run two, it waited for the machine to build. Right now, because I'm resizing, whatever I, I target that cluster will need to wait for a couple of, uh, a couple of seconds to spin, spin up one machine. Okay, let's go into the notebooks. The first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna look into deploying a model, okay? And because I believe, and you'll see here a very usual uh, um, notebook experience because I believe most folks are more, uh, are more, um, give me a second to reconnect, are more uh, um, used to the normal Jupyter Notebook. So what I'll do, I'll just go behind the scenes, the same, the same cluster that I'm running with the same Azure um, compute, um, sorry, the same uh, Notebook VMs that's running. Okay, I'm just going behind the scenes and you can see there's no magic. I'm abstracting this from you, but if you want to see the, the notebook itself, you can see the notebook itself, okay? Uh, um, the Jupyter Notebook platform. I'm going to go and look at the first way to train on a remote cluster. Remember, first I, I was just training locally. I didn't show you that code, but it was locally. Now I'm going to show you uh, how to do the training remotely. Now, basically, I'm loading that workspace that I sh show you, I shown you before on the UI. I'm loading it. Um, it's this one here. I'm telling which experiment I want to run this on, this particular training. I'm, I'm, and then I'm doing something interesting, which is I'm putting the training the training script I'm writing locally on the file. Why? Because when I deploy this on the cluster, this is going to run and it's going to write this code locally as the training.py, which is the file I want it to run. To, to run. Um, it's basically, you can see it here, it's just, um, um, it's a transfer learning model. It uses exception, okay? So I'm not building this from scratch. I'm using exception. Um, and obviously it takes 15 minutes. I'm not going to do this right now. One of the good things is that I can train this because
because it's on a GPU cluster, on much bigger mis image sizes. So on my local machine, I was training on 71 by 71, which is the minimum for exception. Here I can do 200. So obviously the accuracy jumped uh, once I um, trained the model here. And you can see um, here I'm building the environment for the training job. So I'm telling the, I'm telling the, the cluster management tool, here's the, the conda environment I need, here's the PIP packages that I, the, the Python packages that I need and so on, okay? I'm telling it which target to do. In this case, I told it to run on a data science VM um, on Azure. Um, I'm giving it a little bit like the training file, a little bit more information, um, and then it starts running, okay? And then I can monitor on the portal while it's running, or I can monitor here because I know the name of the run. I can do this, which is just run it here, and you can see the logs. It already run. And if I look at the log for this specific run that I run, I did last night, um, you can see that it achieved an accuracy of 0.99.41. Okay, and it took took 15 minutes, roughly 15 minutes to run the full um, the full process. Okay, so now it's I trained the model. I have a model. I actually saved it locally as part of my training file. You will see here that I saved it locally. Okay. I saved it locally in the output folder. So what I will do, I will just register the model. Okay, I'll take that model and I'll register it on our model registry. So it's here. And you can see it created a new version for that. Meaning it's obvious again, data was version, data sets were version, models are version. A, B, test comparison of data, models, everything along the way. You see the productivity that you can achieve with this, right? Now, I want to deploy this. I have a model, it's in my central repository. Um, now I want to deploy that as a web service, okay? So I will, again, connect to the SDK. I will open up the workspace. I will look in, uh, exactly at all the models that are in there. I pick the model I want to deploy, which is the one I saved before and trained before. I'll create the, the Docker image for scoring for the inference piece. Um, so basically, this is just the inference code. It's very similar to the one I did on the first notebook, if you can see. Uh, same thing, I pass it an image of an airline and it tells me uh, which airline is in the picture, okay? Again, I, I pass it the dependencies that I need for that specific environment to run, okay? I'm gonna tell it exactly what do I need. I probably, in this case, it's num yeah, very basic uh, uh, packages. Uh, it then creates the, uh, the image, the container image, and it deploys it. Um, exactly, the, sorry. This step is to deploy the image in a registry, okay? Uh, in Azure Container Registry. If, if, you can, if you go back here, it's deploying here, and then taking that registry and deploying the image as a, 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 an ACI image, okay? Meaning that you can get it deployed without the need for any orchestrator. If you want to deploy to Kubernetes, for instance, perfect, you can do it, okay? And the last step is to actually expose it as a web service, okay? And what you have here, it will give you an, an, a web service endpoint that if you go here, you can explore, obviously. It's here, the endpoint, okay? I'm gonna go very quickly back to VS Code because I know we're running out of time and I'm gonna show you the code for inference, okay? So I'm taking the workspace, Okay, I'm telling it exactly what's the workspace name, what's the endpoint I want to um, target. Okay, I'm passing it the image, and if the image is this one, okay. Uh, no, that's the Emirates image, sorry. The image is this one. And if I run this, it will tell me that it's uh, Singapore Airlines plane. There you go, Singapore Airlines, 99%. If I comment this and give it um, Emirates Airlines plane, just in case you don't trust that <laughs> the model actually does what it says it does, it's even more sure that the other file, which is this one, is a, an Emirates Airlines uh, plane, okay? Now, we are almost out of time, so I'm not gonna do a demo for MLOps, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about MLOps, because what we saw um, can be used to build MLOps or DevOps for machine learning or DevOps for data science or a little bit data ops, okay, beyond data ops. MLOps is a philosophy, okay? It's not a tools, it's like when DevOps, when you look at DevOps, you look at the people, the process, and the, and the products or technology, 
that enables continuous delivery of value to end users. That's the same thing we want to achieve with, with, uh, with machine learning. Okay? We want to go from iterating by ourselves in closed loops into full circles where our code gets fully managed, fully deployed, goes into production, is monitored for, again, for data drift or for any type of, of deviance during production, comes back, and that flow is not just within the data science life cycle. That flow goes from data science in, in, into, into development teams, goes into production, then comes back. Okay? I'm going to give you, uh, I'm going to move a little bit faster, I'm sorry. So I'm going to um, tell you a little bit, obviously you've probably seen this before, we're connecting the, um, the, the right most two pieces, which is DevOps that we've heard of, with the, the machine learning life cycle. Okay? What you saw today that helps you achieve that, you saw a little bit on the Azure machine learning piece, which covers the machine learning uh, uh, or data science life cycle, covers a little bit of DevOps because you, I didn't show you pipelines, but you could have pipelines inside Azure machine learning. You saw the versioning. You didn't see me committing code to Git, but in the background, if you saw it on VS Code, there were already um, the Git button was enabled and I was submitting the code to GitHub. What's missing here is whenever I submitted, whenever I did like a, a push on that, on all of that code that I, I was using on, uh, um, on VS Code, triggering a new build of something that goes into production. Okay, so that automation piece that we can ach achieve through um, Azure DevOps, it's the only, miss that, uh, the only piece that was missing today and that I didn't show you, okay? Uh, this is, I'm gonna give this as reference. This is an MLOps um, reference architecture uh, that we've built. Um, the links are at the bottom. Um, if you can, if you, you have several resources here, this is uh, the QR code for you to download the deck with all the resources. Um, my, uh, I don't do a lot of social media, unfortunately, but if you just um, look at J-O-A-O-B-I, um, I'm gonna put it, it's in the beginning of the, the session. Um, you can, it's my email, it's my pretty much everything. Whoops. And with that, I will open up for any questions. Any questions? Yes, please. Actually, I didn't need to. You're right. Why did I? I didn't need to. Uh, why did I do that? Oh yes, you're right. I invoked it through the. You're absolutely right. I invoked it, it through um, the Azure Machine Learning API, but I didn't need to do that. Absolutely. So, I write uh, once the endpoint is done. Yeah, 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 yeah. I did. Very good question because I, uh, I was doing it inside the notebook before, and in the notebook I was using the normal SDK. So the SDK is useful for two things. Very good point. I mean, you're definitely paying attention for sure a lot to this. So the SDK is useful for managing the whole experience. You can do everything you can do on the UI, on the, um, obviously on the SDK. Uh, once you have the endpoint, you just need to query it like a normal endpoint. You're absolutely right. I just, I could, I, and I showed you, right? I showed you here the endpoint, it's here, okay? You have the URI here and you can just call it and invoke it normally, it's just that Good point, very good point. I was completely blindsided by doing everything. The other thing I didn't show you, obviously. Um, uh, sorry, give me a second, because I promised I would show this. And it's, uh, where is it? Do I not have it on the Mac? Um, any other questions? Good question. By the way, good question. You got a special <laughs> Can you use? Uh, I like V. The, uh, v. Yeah, v. I am. Yeah, yeah, V. Can, yeah. can I use the V in the VS Code? Good question. I think there's an add-in for that for sure, an extension for that for sure. Yeah. I don't use it, but for sure. <laughs> and if not, you can build an extension, but I'm pretty sure. Like the key bindings for Vim for sure.
and I'm starting to run Here's the easy thing about Visual Studio Code. You can use it the same way everywhere, but the extensions might not work the same. I mean, they work the same, but you might not have the same extensions every, in all deployments. So I don't know which one was first. Just a very quick one. Uh, is the D prep package available in the uh, panel service? D prep, the one from uh, Workbench. Oh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> There's a data prep package, yes. Yes. Yeah. Not exactly the same as this one in the world. Okay. But there is a data prep. I didn't show you data, I didn't show you data pipelines today. Uh, but there is a data pipeline in which data prep is part. And if you go to the, the docs, the Microsoft docs, um, you'll get all the classes from the SDK and one of them is still the old data package. Yeah, when you install the extensions. Okay. Um, for uh, it showed several several Python extensions mm -hmm. there, right? Uh, so which other ones do you recommend? Good question. So I currently use the Microsoft one, okay, because now it's caught up with most of the other ones, and it's the most popular one, okay. You obviously, you're free to use whichever one you use. And uh, what I would ask you, please, if you use any other ones that you find better than the Microsoft one, let me know because I want to try them too, okay. Good question. So I actually, because of GPU training on that specific model that I built that I built roughly a year and a half ago, it requires very old TensorFlow, so 1.12, 1.13. And I, I struggle a little bit doing it on, um, on newer versions. We're not running out of the box, and I didn't have so using the old character. But you can put the version whatever you want. Once you build the dependencies for your cluster, you can run whatever version um, you want. So, is there any community version for this? You can try working on the The question was is. The question was, is there a community version? So, VS Code is free, okay? Um, the extensions are all free. Uh, Azure Machine Learning Studio is a, uh, or work, sorry, Azure Machine Learning Services. Um, it's uh, um, an, an Azure service, so you can sign up and get a free trial and you'll get credits for, for it, like any Azure service. Everything else I've shown here is, um, is free. Um, thanks for the talk. Uh, maybe a bit of a No, no, yeah, so basically if I want to move, if I want to convince other people in my company that you should move to Azure, it would be useful if there was also already a path in case that goes wrong and you could go back. Is there a way to sort of whatever we build there, you could run it somewhere else? Maybe, at a, um, uh, of course, you would support it as a first-class citizen, but maybe uh, sort of as an emulator mm -hmm. that you can use, and maybe it's slow because it's not the greatest. Good question. So whatever you saw there, like the machines, the virtual machines, you just need to be with an IP. Okay, so in theory, if you can do uh, that connection, that uh, you get connection back to whatever cloud you're using, mm -hmm. or you expose those machines to the, the cloud if you want to, uh, to, to, to public internet, you can train them whatever you want to train, for instance. And uh, obviously, the workbench SDK needs mm -hmm. to run on Azure because it just has the platform. Okay, but everything else, all the infrastructure pieces that you saw here, some actually work on that machine, on that, on that physical um, piece of hardware. So if I try to connect to them, they will fail because it's not connected to the internet. Right now. All the hardcore training and interest, you can run whatever you want. Right? I don't advise that, but you can do it. <laughs> of course you can. Uh, can you talk a bit about how you keep track of data drift so when uh, during production you know that you need to be data? Let's take that offline, please. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Long topic. Okay, so yeah, I, I, I avoided a couple, not avoided, I, I, because of the, the size of the talk, there's a couple of very interesting points around hyperparameter tuning, around data drift that I didn't uh, adopt today. Okay, we can, we can take it a little bit offline. That's okay. Okay, we're at super over time. Thank you very much for your time and hope it was useful to you. Thank you.